Okay, good afternoon, early evening. Uh, welcome to all. My name is Dr. Amit Singh. I'm a cardiologist in our community for the past 13 years. Also have the privilege of being the medical director of the Cayuga Heart Institute, and I uh, serve as the chairman of the board of CAP, and we're gonna hear a lot more about what that means uh, during our uh, visit with all of you today. Boy, what a nice big crowd we have, a lot of people. Uh, there's two things I'm really excited about this morning. I'm gonna be, into, or this afternoon, I'm gonna be introducing uh, my esteemed colleagues. And one of the nice things is you don't always know what kind of treasures you have in your working relationships. And we have really two exciting speakers, uh, and then we'll be supplemented by three terrific panelists to have a discussion. Um, today we're gonna to hear about part one, the paradigm change in healthcare delivery and how it affects our community. Uh, I'd like to introduce both our speakers, beginning with Dr. Stallone will be speaking first. I've known Dr. Stallone for a few years. He's a terrific doctor, but I didn't know how awesome he really is till I read his CV. Dr. Stallone is a physician like myself. He is an MD. He also has an MBA, both from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he came to us from Rhode Island where he has worked as a hospitalist. He's actually the hospitalist medical director at, Q, at Cuga Medical Center and is the medical director of CAP. So he's intimately involved in all the work we are doing to really bring uh, engaging with our community, our partners, the various subspecialties on healthcare provision. Dr. Stallone is a Cornell graduate as well, so we're excited to have him. Our second speaker presenter today will be yet another Cornell graduate, Cornellian, Mr. Rob Lawless, and Rob I'm also excited to work with. He's the executive director of CAP. And basically CAP, there'll probably be a lot better details provided, but that's the doctors working with the hospital to provide best care for all of you. Um, Mr. Lawless has been with us since, uh, what is it, four, four, three or four, uh, well he's lived in the Ithaca area since 09 and he completed his uh, degree, yeah, I thought this was cool, systems engineering master from Cornell. <laughs> That's what we need. And he's been our executive director for a few years, so we're excited to have both of them. So I'd like you all to put your hands together and welcome Dr. Stallone up here. There will be time for questions from the audience later as part of our panel discussion. Marty? I think the first rule in any presentation is not to trip coming up to speak and not to trip leaving, so we, we passed that part. But uh, thank you very much. First of all, can everyone hear me okay if I speak like this? You know, Amit has that good radio voice next to the microphone. I'm gonna stand back a little bit, and if you can hear me, this is a little bit more comfortable. But I'm really thrilled about um, the introduction. It was a kind introduction. Thank you, uh, Dr. Singh. And let me just make sure this actually clicks and works. Well, while that's happening, I don't know if you can troubleshoot the, maybe just pull it out and then put it in. It was working a second ago. But I wanted just to say how excited we are as a community to talk to you and engage the community. This is a first time for us. CAP is an organization that's been operating for many years now, and we've always thought about approaching the community, particularly the business community and the academic community, and making sure that our story is told and the good work that we're doing and the goals that we're aspiring to and, and as of today achieving many of them you could share in and accentuate our future efforts. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we start. I do want to thank the Green Star team. They were very easy to work with. This is a wonderful venue. You guys look great. This is a, a wonderful venue. So thank you to them for putting this together and this was very, their hospitality was wonderful. Uh, there should be handouts. Everyone should have signed in articulated which organization you represent and gotten a handout. And in the handout is our presentation. There's also some information about our organization, including all the members of CAP, and particularly the primary care doctors. And that was one of the things we wanted you to walk away with was a sense of who are we talking about when we talk about CAP. Questions, it's perfectly fine for you to raise your hand. I just have to disclaim, this is a difficult topic. What I'm gonna talk about tonight is complicated. Uh, what Rob is going to take in his section is even more complicated about the organizational structure. Uh, this is something you can go, you can teach a whole course on. 
uh, but we only have about 45 minutes to talk to you and then a panel discussion, so we're going to stay at a high level. We've tried to simplify every slide, but if there's something that's not clear, feel free to raise your hand. If we push it to the Q&A, that's one way. It's not that we don't want to address it, but if it's going to be handled in another slide or in the question and answer, we'll say so. And then Dr. Singh is going to mo uh, moderate the Q&A. And then you might notice this is being videotaped. We wanted people who don't have the opportunity to listen to this and be here tonight to have access to it. And it'll be present on our website. And that's another thing we wanted to take you to take away with you is that at this URL, you can see information about CAP that lists the member practices and a little bit about our organization, including our mission and what we're aspiring to do. Uh, all of the people, all of the doctors that you'll see on the CAP website are people who are involved in the clinical integration program. And I've peppered our presentation with pictures just so you get a sense of the doctors that you, you'll probably know some of them in our community who are working on this. So Dr. Gelber is uh, an obstetrician and very instrumental in our CAP effort. I won't introduce all the people that you see, but just realize those are people who are actually taking part in this effort. This is Dr. Bale. We have a special section on the website because we are an accountable care organization, an ACO. I'm going to minimize the acronyms, but that's one that I want you to know about, and you all probably know a little bit about that. But Medicare requires us to have information and disclosures on our website, so I really would encourage you to go and take a look at that. And then before I dive in, just a couple of acknowledgments. I do want to recognize the CAP staff. Events like this don't just happen, and a lot of the things that have become automatic in our community uh, happen only with an amazing staff. So they're usually in the back of the room making sure everything goes well. So I just wanted to thank you. And Amit, as leader of the board, leads a group of individuals who are very uh, future-minded and very concerned about the future of health care and its affordability and its high quality. So thank you to both those groups. Uh, Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield is our oldest and most mature value-based purchasing arrangement. They're partnering with us now for several years to achieve goals and objectives around population health. Things like reducing the rate of increase of health care cost and improving population-wide parameters of health. And they've been wonderful to work with. And they're kind of an example of a provider group insurance company relationship. And you're going to hear from Mr. Jim Reed. He'll take part in the panel and answer some questions, but uh, just certainly thank you. Uh, Cornell and TCOG, TCOG Tompkins County uh, Council on Government and the Health Consortium, uh, Paul Bursick in particular from Cornell and Mr. Don Barber from TCOG, they have pushed harder than anyone for us to come to the community and talk about what we're doing. So a lot of this has to do with those gentlemen. So thank you uh, specifically. And finally, the Chamber of Commerce. The invitation came through the Chamber of Commerce. And although there are large purchasing groups of healthcare, the single largest purchasing group of health insurance is through the small business community, through individual products. And so we felt like the Chamber of Commerce advertising this would actually be the perfect um, invitation and collection of individuals to share our story. So this talk is geared towards a business perspective, businesses who buy insurance on behalf of members and employees. So what are we going to talk about? We usually start internal to our physician community. We start with talking about what CAP is. Right? What, what is the organization? How is it structured? I think that's going to be best in the context of the healthcare environment and the challenges. So I'm going to start by talking about why we asked you here. We're going to talk about the macroeconomic situation in healthcare, and our community is no different in many respects for what I'm going to talk about with respect to national trends. And in the context of that, Rob is going to talk about what the organization comprises and who the members are and how we operate. And then I'm going to come back and talk about what we do and give you some results that the local physicians and the hospital, Cayuga Medical Center, have achieved around the populations that we're being measured upon. And that's just a taste of what we hope to continue to achieve in years to come. And so now is the time with some results and with some stability in our network operations and with support from multiple payers for multiple populations, and we'll talk about what we mean by what I just said, to come to you and get your support so that we can go even farther along this journey of controlled costs and improved quality. And then finally, uh, next steps, because this is the first of three series. So we're going to talk mainly about population health and the changing healthcare environment. So why did we ask you here? The, the shortest, most blunt answer is that you guys are paying for our clinical integration program, although you might not appreciate you're doing so. Right, you pay for it through health care premiums, and the self-insured among you pay through contributions uh, with a, a higher member fee individually. These these, this effort, the clinical integration program that I'm going to tell you about, has yielded discrete and undeniable benefit to our community. 
and I'll show you data to show you what I'm talking about. And as I just mentioned, the greatest opportunity is to really garner community support behind what we're talking about. So now's the time to talk to you about it. And the truth is, healthcare involves everyone, not just as a patient, but certainly as a business. Those of you who aren't tackling a specific health problem, knock on some wood or wood-like substance around you because that's only a matter of time. And the truth is, from a business perspective, healthcare costs really drive corporate costs, right? They're a key component of corporate profitability and competitiveness. And in a global market, you guys either experience it directly or those of you who aren't directly in the position to pay for healthcare expenses, you hear that this is one of the struggles that American companies face to remain competitive in a global economy. So the economic environment, particularly in the 2008 timeframe and then manifest in the Affordable Care Act in 2010, recognized the need for a change, hence the Affordable Care Act. But I'll remind you that CAP leaders present in this room and previous CAP leaders at the hospital and among our physician community made an independent decision before the Affordable Care Act to organize our healthcare community in a structure that could accommodate accountable care. And I'll talk to you about what I mean in a little bit. So this is something we read in the tea leaves and committed to do. And again, we know that there's going to be cost and quality objectives that is expected of our community, is expected of our provider group. I'm not going to barrage you with too many health economic macro slides, only a few to make a point. And I like this slide because it demonstrates a simple fact that the total cost in healthcare is growing at an unsustainable rate. And I like this graph because it's cut up into the average employer contribution and employee contribution. And the total line is growing faster than inflation. Uh, you know, there's different numbers at different years. The point is it outstrips inflation, and so does the employer and the employee cost. And in particular, this is important. The employee share is the bottom, I hope this projects okay, the darker blue um, graph represents what employees endure with respect to their costs. And this wasn't always so substantial. Kind of the, the decade before and even before that, there were much smaller employee costs. And I don't think employers, no one says employers are doing this as a a priori strategy. It's really for reprieve from the absolute rise in costs. I mean, the fact is that to keep someone's health benefits at a stable level and not even to pay them wage increases is to give workers a pay increase that's unsustainable. Just the cost of health benefits within their benefit packages was unsustainable. So employers are turning to things like high deductible plans or greater contributions from the employees, and that has implications. At the same time, employees are experiencing higher health care costs out of pocket. They're paying a higher portion of the growing health care costs. Wages have stayed relatively flat in this period. And so what you have is health care being an increasing percentage of median income. And just think about that. You, I, I feel like I may be preaching to the choir. People have to make very difficult, really unconscionable decisions about where they may live or how well they can eat or how they attain transportation or all the things that we don't want healthcare costs to crowd out. But that's the truth. And even with high deductible plans, if you look at the percent increases of the employer and employee contributions, it's asymmetrically on the employee, uh, on average. That might not be everyone's situation, but on average, the workers shoulder the majority of the increase. Why do we care about? An important point is workers aren't making Health, employees aren't making health care decisions as they might if, if it was more affordable, it was a lower percentage of their income. So people are defraying treating chronic conditions, let alone preventative care, right? So people are coming to work sicker or not coming to work at all. When people come to work sicker, uh, they're not producing as much. There's absenteeism and presenteeism. There's a whole body of literature that's emerged on health and productivity in the workforce. And when people miss work, oftentimes there's a spouse that must accompany them, right? So this is actually a real important thing for employers to think about, even though they might be shifting costs, and again, rationally so, to workers. This is leading to not as healthy workforce as we would like. That's the cost side, and I was, I was getting into the quality piece, but what about actual quality parameters, compliance with national requirements? There's always a gap in care across all of the major parameters by which we measure the quality of our health care. And things like colorectal cancer screening and breast, care screen, breast cancer screening are not where we'd like them to be. 
So these are national averages. These are both from around the 2013 area, and I I'm, I'm chose 2013 because I'm going to show you data from CAP starting in 2013 later in the presentation. But there's a gap between where we would like these statistics to be and where we are today. And it goes without saying, but I'll say it, that if we close the gap, we would avert a lot of health care costs and the human toll, the financial and human toll of these diseases. And we talk in terms of cancer screening of lives averted, but there's a morbidity or a pain and suffering associated with these diseases when they're not caught as earlier as they could be. So for a lot of reasons, we have a lot to do in the quality arena. And I started with cost, and maybe I should have inverted the order, but it's really a cost and a quality problem. And so our country is seeking accountable care. And by accountable care, colloquially, what we're talking about is provider groups shouldering in some of the final accountability to cost and quality that before this era has been only had by the health insurance company. Because most of the purchasers, the ultimate purchasers of health care, buy insurance from an insurance company. But there was no kind of promise that the ultimate health care they were receiving were, was coordinated to any ultimate goal. So now we do have a goal where provider groups like CAP, you can, hopefully you can see where I'm going with this, are going to take on accountability to cost and quality outcomes. So there's things called value-based purchasing contracts. These are very elaborate contracts. They're, they're you know, not the normal skill set of insurance companies, but they monitor the quality parameters and cost parameters of a population of patients. And provider groups have to shape themselves to participate in that meaningfully. It doesn't just happen. In a community like this, where there's you know, dozens and dozens of independent, financially independent practices, there's not an emergent property that allows all those providers to cooperate with various payers for coherent goals around cost and quality. It doesn't happen automatically. So this is a total repeat slide. I want to foot stomp. Again, why do you care? Because CAP created its clinical integration program to organize the healthcare community to cooperate with payers for national cost and quality objectives. We did that in conjunction with the largest you know, self-insured clients and all the insurers, but because it was notional at the beginning and because we were building our network, it was impossible to really communicate what we were doing because it was a concept. But what we did, and what we really started operating in 2013, specifically around value-based contracts, we've made great headway. And we've already got very promising results. And that'll come later in the presentation. Don't look ahead. But the greatest opportunity is if we get on the same page. If we actually talk about what we've done so far and ask the question, how can we go farther? What can you do as employers to take the next step? How can we incentivize patients to cooperate with a network that agrees on the goal but doesn't necessarily know how to get there? This talk is just talking about population health and, and, and the existence of value-based contracts and really the environment and you could call it the game. It's, it's how we operate as a team. The second talk that we're going to give, hopefully in January, is really about engaging the patients around this. And that's a whole other topic about once the system is set, the incentives are aligned, how do you engage patients and actually make a meaningful uh, accomplishment? And so I might have made it seem, and I hope I didn't, that accountability is ambient in the system. Yes, there's a bad economic environment, health economic environment at least, you say largely an economic environment too. And the country's demanding accountability, and well, CAP's doing it. Is this happening everywhere? And I would say decidedly no. Even though there's accountable care organizations commercially and through government programs in name, they're not all engaged to the same extent as an organization like CAP. I would point out that since 2010, CAP is the only coherent local effort on a, on a large scale to tackle total population cost and total population quality. And I think that's worth noting. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rob. Again, the order is, I hope I, I laid the groundwork for the call for a program like CAP to exist. The goal of the next section, not to, to speak for Rob, is to describe the network in general and, and then come back and talk about what we're doing and then talk about how we can take the next step. So I'm going to hand it over to Rob, and hopefully he will not trip coming up. So Marty and I conferred, getting the volume. Lloyd, raise your hand if I'm not loud enough. I know the, the risk is low, but uh, let me know. 
Uh, so Marty and I conferred on acknowledgments in advance, so I won't repeat all of the acknowledgments he made, but I will say we benefited from tremendous support from a lot of members of our community, and also we wouldn't be here without the tremendous engagement of both our staff that supports this organization and all of the uh, physicians and organizations supporting them that are part of CAP as well. Um, so really, uh, we would not be here without all of those players uh, supporting us. So I'm going to talk about first who we are, and then get into the discussion a little bit about what we do, and then pass it back to Marty, who will talk about some specific clinical initiatives and the results of our program. So who are we? Right, so CAP is the short name for two organizations, Cayuga Area Plan and Cayuga Area Preferred, that exist separately uh, to accommodate some regulatory requirements. But these organizations have common governance and, and also common ownership. So really, uh, for our purposes, it's helpful just to think in terms of CAP, which means these two organizations. So CAP is owned, CAP is a partnership of Cuga Area Physicians Alliance and Cuga Medical Center. Probably many of you are familiar with Cuga Medical Center because it is the only hospital in Tompkins County. Cuga Medical Center is a 204-bed medical center, and it has five different physical locations in and around the area that support the services it provides to the community. And uh, it's also a member of Cuga Health System. Cuga Area Physicians Alliance is probably an organization that uh, you have heard less about. You may have heard it, you may have seen it in practice offices, uh, but, uh, and you may know a lot about it. But for those of you that don't, Cuga Area Physicians Alliance uh, is uh, a organization of about 200 physicians locally. It includes uh, both employed and independent physicians in the community, and it is Cuga Medical Center's partner in CAP. Now, when we talk about who are the members of CAP, who are the participants in CAP, we're really talking about Cuga Medical Center and the physicians of Cuga Area Physicians Alliance who are all participants in CAP. So the physicians, who are the physicians in CAP A or Cuga Area Physicians Alliance in CAP? We have about 55 PCPs across primary care physicians, across 15 practices. That encompasses family medicine, uh, internal medicine, and pediatric care. And we also have an, an additional 145 specialists across an additional 30 practices. And those are, are both, both the primary care and specialist practices span uh, employed, again, organizations that uh, have a relationship with the hospital and independent organizations. Uh, we have physician offices as small as a single doctor with very limited support staff. And then the largest practice in our community is Cuga Medical Center's practice, Cuga Medical Associates. And that has about 50 docs. And again, all of these providers are uh, participants uh, and members in CAP. When you look at this geographically, we, uh, this is zoomed in on Ithaca, and there are other provider locations outside that serves Tompkins County. But we really provide the, between the physicians and the hospital, the majority of medical care that's provided both in Ithaca and then in Tompkins County. Now when we talk about provider organizations like ours and clinically integrated networks, Marty used that term and I'll explain it in a moment, um, we're, we are not the only one um, and we are not unique in being a clinically integrated network, but something that is relatively unique about us is how much of the care we provide in this geographic area. And in terms of addressing all the issues that Marty raised uh, that are uh, are uh, part of the national economy and also local issues, we have a really uh, unique opportunity. We're especially well placed to tackle some of those issues. So what is CAP? What is CAP's mission statement? CAP's mission is uh, to unify its member organizations in the pursuit of high quality, accessible, and cost-effective healthcare for the population of patients we serve. For those of you that deal with healthcare every day and healthcare improvement and policy, you're probably from familiar with the, the triple aim. Um, our, uh, our mission statement resembles the triple aim very closely. We're covering um, uh, quality improvement, uh, cost effectiveness, and then population health overall. We separately in our mission statement name access because when we look at the issues that are affecting our community, it's one that's top of mind for us. So we support this mission through our clinical integration program. So Marty used this phrase, I used this phrase probably twice already. What is clinical integration? Again, it's not something we invented, uh, although I think we have uh, some things that we do particularly well and uniquely, uh, but clinical integration is a, a concept that's been in play for actually over 20 years, although the Federal Trade Commission uh, issued a formal opinion about it beginning in uh, 1996 that we're referencing here. Uh, so there are many clinically integrated networks, and the real common characteristics between them are 
a high degree of interdependence and cooperation between providers. So providers are coming together and working together and solving problems and collaborating. And those providers have a collection of initiatives or programs of initiatives that are focused on controlling costs and ensuring quality. Also, these organizations are supported by infrastructure, an organization like the organizational side of CAP that I'm going to talk about that specifically is capable of evaluating and supporting physicians in modifying practice patterns. So we actually measure stuff and give meaningful information to providers. One of the things that you don't see on here, and this is a big piece of what clinical integration is, is about, is that you don't have to all be employed by the same company. This doesn't have to be all under one organization. When I mentioned the practices across, fat, across CAP, we actually have more than 40, more than 45 uh, uh, independent organizations that are partnering in this. And what clinical integration is really about is getting uh, the efficiency of a larger collaboration while maintaining the independence of organizations and some of the benefits that come from that. So specifically for us, again, a mechanism for independent providers and organizations to collaborate and make improvements, and it gives us the effectiveness uh, well of a larger organization while maintaining the benefits of the diversity of independent organizations and the ability to innovate. So when I mentioned primary care, I described that we have 15 different primary care practices in CAP that range from a single doctor up to uh, uh, seven uh, plus eight as, as assistance practice. Uh, those practices have a variety in care patterns and the way that they serve their patients, but what they have in common is a commitment to quality improvement and a commitment to supporting the population in the ways that the CAP program specifically identifies should be everywhere primary care is delivered. So we've got diversity, but at the same time that we have diversity and innovation, we have a consistent focus on the things that our providers agree are important to focus on. And just two quick point, points that I think are also important about the clinical integration program. Participation is voluntary. So if you live in Tompkins County and you're a doctor, you don't have to be in CAP, right? It, you, can, you choose to be in CAP. But when you choose to be in CAP, Participation comes with requirements. So we have a community of physicians that have voluntarily committed to undertake some efforts to tackle the issues that Dr. Stallone described. So that was a high level of who we are. What's our, and clinical integration, what is our structure and governance to support this? I mentioned that Cugary Physician Alliance and Cuga Medical Center are the partners in CAP. Uh, each of those organizations appoint members to our board of directors, and the board of directors has overarching responsibility for governance of the program. The real work of the clinical integration program happens in our physician clinical integration committees. And we actually have six of these committees, and when you look across our different boards and physician committees, we have about a quarter of our physicians involved in governance at any given time, and those committees rotate through. And those physicians that aren't directly involved in governance, they're still involved in the quality improvement efforts and quality measurement efforts that we're undertaking. But a quarter of your provider membership involved in governance is actually a pretty impressive and unusual statistic. So I'm not going to go through each of these, but just to describe the life cycle of one thing that we did to give you a flavor for how this works and how the physician governance aspect of this works, Dr. Stallone mentioned colorectal cancer screening is one of the places where there's a significant national gap in quality. Colorectal, appropriate colorectal cancer screening has actually been a metric for CAP since 2012, um, since the inception of the clinical integration program, really. And the way that that came to be is we have a clinical guidelines committee that assesses medical literature and requests from payers and other parties to determine what are the things and the standards that we're going to focus on as a community. And so since 2012, actually, colorectal cancer screening has been uh, a requirement for all primary care providers. We also have, and again, I won't go through all of them, but a performance improvement committee that for that measure decided on goals for our whole network. What do we as a network want to achieve for the population? and then also individual goals so that everybody was expected to improve in a way that would reach, help the network reach its overall goals. So that's the clinical integration governance side of this. I mentioned that there's also a lot of work, you know, when we talk about metrics, uh, who is making metrics work, right? Who's helping gather data, who's helping measure, and then who's helping us actually work with providers to affect change. CAP has a support staff that includes Dr. Stallone and myself and uh, a significant team that's present in the room. And I'm not going to go through everybody or roles, but major function areas, we have a lot of work 
in understanding the data we're talking about. And so we have IT and data warehousing. We have care management and care coordination and practice analytics and support. And again, in addition to uh, Dr. Stallone and myself as the medical director and executive director. In summary, who are we, right? We're a collection of providers with support and supporting organizations that have committed to and are uh, participating in a program where we're able to improve and change things to improve cost and quality. So we're a collection of providers committed and able to improve cost and quality. We are turning the focus of that program towards performance in these value-based purchasing arrangements and performance for the populations uh, that Dr. Stallone began the introduction of. Today, our program is orchestrating the management of care for over 40,000 local residents and separate payer populations. So when we, we use this, when we use this phrase populations, what are we talking about? And I'm gonna to get to that in just a second. This is our third section of the presentation that I'm going to take the beginning of uh, in talking about how we define and understand our population. And then I'm going to pass it back to Marty to wrap us up with some specific clinical initiatives that we've taken and uh, our performance results. So first, before to define our population, the first thing we need to do is understand our population. To define populations and understand their performance, we first need to, do, to, we need to, uh, we need to understand our population. And a big piece of that is understanding data about our population, a wordful. Um, so healthcare is broadly considered uh, or described data rich and knowledge poor. For those of you that have ever gotten a medical record from a hospital or a physician, you probably got 200 pages of stuff. There's tons of data, right? If you were in the hospital, maybe every vital sign that was ever taken on you. So there's lots of data that's gathered, but drawing actual information and knowledge from that is not easy. That is our specialty. That's our focus, is figuring out how to find pearls of information and how to make uh, judgments about the population overall using that information. I wanna pause and just acknowledge to accomplish this, we have staff internally that do a lot of work. We also rely on a number of partners that help us make this happen. One of them that was able to join us today uh, is Healthy Connections. For those of you that are not aware of what Healthy Connections is, Healthy Connections is a Syracuse-based organization that's part of a network of organizations in New York State that specialize in getting information from all these different places and making it available to providers. That's, those organizations are called RIOs. Um, and Healthy Connections is, is a key partner of ours, uh, and uh, we, we don't look to, we look to encourage the use of their systems wherever we can, and they also help us do the work that we do. So, once we get information, we seek to define and understand populations and performance of populations. So now I'm getting to describing what it is that populations are. Um, so for our purposes, populations are collections of individuals that we understand. So at the individual, we know who somebody is, we know characteristics of the care that they're provided, we know things that they've gotten and had done, and we know things that they haven't had done. And collectively, when we put individuals together, we have a population of individuals. And for that population, those populations, we look to track the total cost and measure aggregate quality of care. So how, how do these populations get defined? And this goes to the way that the value-based purchasing world has really uh, defined populations. Primary care services in most arrangements and in our arrangements dictate the individuals we're talking about. So the patients that we count in our population are the patients that are in these populations, are the patients that utilize a CAP primary care provider and are part of an insurance company's population that we're tracking. So the populations, the four main populations that we're working on, or in one case working on starting in 2017, are Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield with about 20,000 members. Again, these are Excellus insured or paid patients that use our primary care services and other services. With Medicare, we have about 10,000 patients. And with managed Medicaid, which we're starting value-based purchasing work on in 20. 17, we have about 10,000 lives. And then with Aetna, we have about 9,000 lives. So when we look at these populations collectively, not only we're we seeking to understand what's going on at the individual level 
and identify opportunities at the, indiv at the individual level, but we compile this information to understand what's going on for that whole population. And in the realm of cost, this means for an individual patient understanding all of their medical costs, not just the costs that they get in our community, but the costs that they get outside of our communi community. So if they require a surgery or a specialist service or any service for that matter that happens outside of our community, for the patients we're working to manage, we're still looking at that cost. We look at cost in this way because that is the way that costs that set your premiums um, are looked at. So we take this information at the individual level with our payer partners and roll it up to an average across a population. And then we track that over time. So we say, with a population that had an average cost in this year, based on uh, everything we know about that population, what would we expect its cost to go up uh, under normal circumstances or at the rate of other comparators in the market? And our goal is to be less than that. We want the cost for our patients to go up by less than the cost for patients in other communities. And that goes directly to uh, premiums. So very briefly, and then I'm going to pass it back to Marty, we do the same thing with quality measures. We also measure quality measures for our total population. We have quality measures that span everybody, regardless of the subpopulation that they're contained in. Uh, but for these value-based purchasing arrangements, we also seek to understand the quality of care at the population level for all of our patients and for the individual populations. So. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Let me go back to this slide. So Rob did a, a, the, the very difficult job. I got the easier slides. I don't know if you guys saw that. That's the, the benefit of being the medical directors. You get to do the easy things. Uh, but basically, my question is, after hearing all that, you might be wondering, the, for instance, the data, right? The data exists in places outside of CAP. Is, is a clinical integration program really necessary to accomplish this? What about the insurance industry doing it? Or what about a hospital taking the lead in doing it? Or what about, you know, some other uh, strategy? And I would say in each of those situations, it's really difficult to accomplish aggregate cost and quality goals without a provider network, a complete provider network of the hospital and the physicians involved. And I think our secret sauce, and I'm going to go back to results in just a second and show you some of the things that we've, some of our early results, which are very encouraging. Some of our, uh, I think our secret is that we have access to providers in their practices. Rob did a good job of talking about populations at the population level being roll-ups of things that happen for individual patients. So to improve the population, you have to improve what happens with individual patients. And those gaps exist right down to the individual patients. And we do work at defining who needs what, making lists of gaps in care, and equipping practices with care managers and other techniques to close those gaps, to do the right thing, giving them the right information at the right time for the right patient. And so the secret is that we have access to our providers. And we are providers. So Amit mentioned me as a practicing physician in the network, and so were all of the leaders of the clinical integration program. So when we decide as CAP to do something, it's not coming from Excellus. It might be in line with what Excellus wants, but it's coming from peers. And so peers listen to peers as professionals. And telephonic care management programs where there's a nurse in Syracuse who calls in and points out something that's done wrong typically falls on deaf ears. It would be nice if it didn't, but it does. So the old adage that healthcare is local has never been truer. And so I point out, again, all of the physicians involved in CAP are local community members. And this goes back to a point in keeping with the Chamber of Commerce concept where the businesses that we run are also local businesses that employ our community. One of the tenants, more appropriate for the no another lecture at another time, is that there's a local economic benefit to healthcare remaining in our community. And that's a good thing because in our community, we're modulating and monitoring and trying to improve total cost of care and quality of care. When care leaves, leaves our community, and there's good reasons for it to happen when it must happen, but when it does, we're powerless over the actual quality of the care in many of the situations. So two points, you know, I think CAP has access to providers because we are the providers, and it's a local economic benefit to keep care in Tompkins County. 
So what are some of the things that we actually do? What are, and this is just a sample. We have over 60 metrics that we measure across 40 physician kinds. We have many clinical initiatives. I want to give you a sample of some of the things that we do. We've gotten quite good at facility avoidance, so ER and hospitalization avoidance when we target on a specific population. And so no secret, I'll, well, I'll give you one of the secrets of uh, you know, population management is people who are most likely to be hospitalized and go to the emergency room are already going to the emergency room and being hospitalized. So CAP care managers, these are nurses on the org chart that Rob mentioned, these are people who track patients who go into the hospital and they intervene on their cases and make sure that they're getting care that they need in the community. I would point out they do a Herculean task of mapping all the non-physician oriented care in the community. They really have a great Rolodex, if you will, of all the services that exist in the community and it's a lot of times putting people in touch with services that exist but that patients don't know about it, they haven't been plugged in for. Simple stuff if you do it. It's easy when you know how to do it. But we've gotten very good and there's an anecdotal story I'd share that a patient who left the hospital who was being managed by our care managers ended up being caught on the way to the hospital to deal with a problem that was much more appropriate for the primary care setting, and they redirected that patient to their primary care doctor who didn't know about the hospitalization because it had just happened, and they got the patient the right care, and it was an ER visit avoided, and potentially even an admission, because the ER is sometimes in a situation where they don't have all the facts, and the most conservative thing to do in the situation is to admit the patient. I see the physicians nodding their head. So these things are simple, but they're invaluable to reduce costs. That's, you know, ER care is many times more expensive than primary care and not as appropriate in all situations. One of the questions before the talk that uh, one of uh, the audience members submitted was, what is our strategy on prescribing patterns? And in fact, we have a very robust strategy on prescribing patterns, and it falls into two categories. One is a general tracking of our generic prescribing rates. You may or may not know the same medication, the same chemical compound can exist as a generic medication that's off patent and that can be made competitively by many manufacturers or it can be protected by a patent and charge the much higher price. There's reasons for patents to promote uh, you know, creation and de drug development and so on and so forth, but in terms of our cost goals, it's very reasonable for a net network like ours to make that information about where generic opportunities exist clear to the prescribing doctor. I will tell you, they don't teach you in medical school the relative costs of Lipitor and Simvastatin. It just doesn't happen. It's pharmacist nodding her head. Uh, so we give this information, and a lot of the times it's different for different plans where something comes on or off patent, and there's a lot of s specific patient situation, plan-specific opportunities. Much of this data we've gotten recently from Excellus. It's been invaluable data, and our job as the data company that CAP is is to bend that information back around to the physician community so that they can make good decisions, good cost decisions, without a decrement in quality. Right? Choosing a generic, there's no sacrifice in quality in 99% of the cases. And where there is, our guidelines committee respects that. So there are some situations, not to get too technical, but with anti-epileptics, our neurologists are very clear that there are quality increases with brand drugs. And so we take that out of the equation and we accommodate the use of brand where there's quality. But most times there's not. Choosing wisely is, comes from the American Board of Internal Medicine. It's a collection of practices that have become ingrained in the physician community that don't have data to support it. It's not that we went off of recommendation, but over time the data has changed and some remnants have remained. So these, these posters are some of our campaign against vitamin D testing for osteoporosis. It's not indicated in nine out of 10 clinical situations, but we still see a lot of labs being ordered. So things like this are what we try to educate the physician community not to do. And they, again, coming from the right group, coming from their peers, when they're put in charge of asking these questions of themselves, they come to conclusions that are more easily followed and embraced. And then finally, Rob, again, did a good job of defining how our populations are primary care driven. And our data internally and from our payer partners, our insurance company partners, are organized by primary care physician. We found that when we asked the primary care physicians to do some very specific steps, we needed the partnerships of the specialists. So you may or may not know that if you needed a cardiac surgery, something that we don't do in Tompkins County, we're not a large enough community to do aortic valve replacements and cabbages and things like that, cardiac surgery, 
If you go to different academic medical centers, tertiary care centers in our community, there's sometimes a two or greater times cost difference between them with similar quality statistics. So things like out-of-network referral management, intelligent referral in keeping with quality statistics and cost is something we brought to our primary care community and they very quickly pointed out referrals are a team sport. The team involves the specialist. So the cardiologist in most cases are directing the referrals to cardiac surgery in most cases. So the primary care physician is responsible and through our organization we extend responsibility to the cardiologist and there have been very fruitful discussions and it's Again, easy when you think about it, but not an easy task to get specialists and primary care physicians um, it's nodding in the same room and talk about brass tacks about how to better manage patients, and we're doing it. So those are examples of CAP efforts. Utilization is a, a term that describes how we use the mix of services, not necessarily the cost. The cost problem is not necessarily a, a price issue. It's a how many units are you using, and are the units required in a situation? So you can get into price, but really the real game and what a clinical integration network is poised to do is talk about where we do what and how many do we do and do we deduplicate uh, services uh, where possible. So utilization is all about the number and the types of units. And this is really where we can save the community money. And this is a discussion that has to be, again, among the physician network. There's no way easily to have the insurance company inflict this on a network and it work out as well as it would if this comes from within the network if we make our own decisions. What about our results? I've been saying we're going to show you results, we're going to show you results. On the quality side, these are just two examples of where we started at above average levels. And so I'll start with colorectal cancer screening. Have, has anyone heard of 80 by 2018 campaign? It was on the news the other day. I see some hands. There's a national goal to get to 80% by 2018 colorectal cancer screening. And so we started that, and I got some information on the next slide, but we have an excellent GI group and a cohesive primary care network. Our data was we were at 80% in 2013, and that's not common. We were already a high-quality medical staff, and I can make points about that. But over the course of the last three years, we steadily rose to an 87%. And it's really about those incremental patients. About 900 patients receive colorectal cancer screening consistently. And that translates into lives saved, morbidity averted and lives saved over the next years where that proves benefit. So we don't have, uh, you know, one attitude would be, well, we're already above average. Why work on that? But on the margin, on the increment, there's actually patients who are getting enhanced services, they're getting the right care, and there's a clear benefit to that. I don't have to tell you about that. Breast cancer screening also above average in the low 80s, rose to 88%, uh, the de gap 350 people got breast cancer screening with all the associated benefits. And again, 60 metrics we track, those are the two that are nationally known and, and, and measured across our primary care community. And again, this is just showing, if you wanted to look, just Google, uh, 80 by 2018, and you'll get the color national colorectal cancer uh, information. New York State average 69.3, cap was above 80, rose to 87. Very good work. What about cost? This is how value-based purchasing contracts are generally measured. We baseline our costs in a given year, and we start out comparing our rate of growth. It's the growth rate year over year compared to a population. I'm in the room with experts, so if I get something wrong, Jim will make it right during the panel. He's over there. But basically, CAP, which is the red line, the rate of growth relative to a comparator group was measured, and the cumulative advantage was tracked over the last three years. So to date, we have a 7% rate growth advantage over our comparator group. We grew 7% less than our comparator group. That's the only coherent cost data we have to date. It's from our large Blue Cross population, but it's very promising. We believe that the total effort, the mix of, of activities that I described before are actually making a difference. And so one of the questions that was put forth that I'm going to, uh, I know I'm going to be asked or the panel is going to be asked is, well, how do we translate this benefit to a community benefit? How do we capture the value created by a successful network into premiums? I think that's going to be an explicit part of our discussion. Let me make two points about this that are really important. This line, if it grows above the blue line, if we get more expensive, if our costs go faster than our comparator group, 
we are financially liable for a portion of that. That's ca called risk in value-based contracts. So there's real skin in the game for our physician and hospital network. That's accountability. So if we actually blow our budget, if our patients cost more, there's accountability on the provider community. And then finally, this little, I wish this was a little larger, this is inclusive of CAP program CI costs. That organization costs money to run. The money that we get from our payer partners and our self-insured partners, we count that in our budget. So we, it, you know, it's not one of those things where we beat the budget, but then when you add in the cost of clinical integration, it's even and it's a wash. The contracts universally across all the payers we deal with roll the cost of CI into our budget. So I think those are two important points. To wrap up, what do we want from you? We want you to be aware of CAP. It, this is, I think, the fact that the members of CAP are committed to achieve goals in cost and quality is a great thing for our community. I think we should be more aware of it and we should really push the issue and be more aware of goals and actually push forward. And again, we want to beat competition. And when we beat competition, that's a, a community benefit and Tompkins County could be a better place to, for instance, do business. CAP is accountable for its results. So far, they're favorable. We're early as a network. Networks take about 10 years to fully mature. To get all this done, it takes time. We're at the three to five year mark from when we first started thinking about doing this, and I think we've made amazing progress. Some in the room, obviously, would like to be farther along. We share your sentiment. We want to be farther along, but it just takes time to shape behavior and to get on top of these issues. It's, it's, it's harder than it looks. And the CAP organization requires support. And so far, we've had excellent support from our payer community, but the most valuable support is going to come when the entire community, the largest single block of healthcare purchasers are the small business community. If you all know about this and support this and think about how to engage patients with us, I think that's going to be the full expression of value. Look for CAP practices and support them. Nobody loses their identity, right? So Lloyd works for Family Medicine Associates, Dr. Darlow. That's Family Medicine Associates, it's also a CAP practice. CMA, Cayuga Medical Associates, CMA is CMA, and it's also a CAP practice. It's a mark of quality and accountability. And then finally, start talking to your payer about how they're supporting CAP. I'd call out that Excellus has been wonderfully supportive of our program, but this actually is, it's gonna be easier for them to give us support if this comes from the business community and they hear I like that. I like what they said at that community forum. We support that and we want, we encourage it. So I think that they would do it um, even more robustly. And then before we go on to our panel, what's next? Again, in January, we hope to have another panel to talk explicitly about how to engage patients. And employers have a unique position to do that. There's all sorts of innovative workplace health promotion programs. We can talk about assuring access to our excellent medical care telemedicine techniques, provider portals. There's all sorts of ways that the employer community can bring patients together and actually like we can encourage. Even plan design, if you really want to get sophisticated, there's plan design questions that you can choose with respect to your uh, purchase of health insurance. And then if we can get together in March and talk about a community vision, that question that I hope we talk about is, if CAP is successful, if we work hard and a strange thing happens, we succeed, Right? We, we grow at a lower rate of costs. We actually achieve cost goals. We achieve quality goals. How does that get translated back into a community benefit? How do we get premium relief? Where do we see the benefit? So now's the right time to raise these questions, and um, I hope that you've learned something about CAP. Um, I'm going to give it the microphone to Dr. Singh, and I'm going to invite our panelists to come to the stage. We have a number of questions we collected and uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask other questions as well. And uh, if there are questions that Rob and I can help answering, we'll be available. But hopefully, uh, these leaders can take the floor and field your questions. So we give the presentation, and they field the questions. This is good. 